Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth um, virtual workshop on excitons. Um, my name is Sagi Zhang from City University of New York, Queens College at, and the Graduate Center. Uh, with Chris Baldin at UC Riverside, we have been uh, organizing this virtual workshop. And today we have uh, four exciting uh, speakers. Uh, before I do that, let me also acknowledge uh, the Initiative for Theoretical Sciences at the Graduate Center um, who provide the platform uh, for this workshop. And also I'd like to especially thank Gon Minshel who was actually running all the workshop behind the scene single-handedly. And with that, uh, <clears throat> Let me talk a little bit about today's topic and also let me uh, start with introducing our first speaker. So the topic of today's talk, is, uh, today's workshop is uh, characterization of uh, two-dimensional excitons. So excitons are pretty unrestricted uh, quantum objects in the excited state and confinement especially play very important role for excitons. And now the technology has advanced so much and there are really great environments and materials that can be created to see new aspects and also um, control new ways of excitons. And I think that um, there is no competition in um, that advances. Um, compared to, I mean, when it comes to the uh, two-dimensional excitons. So I'm really excited to see uh, so much, so many important uh, uh, talks today. And we have uh, three um, experimentalists and one uh, theoretician today. And our first speaker is Alchana Raja from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I think she will be able to tell us everything about uh, her exciting uh, talk. Um, our second speaker is Tim Leon from Emory University. And as many of you may know, uh, he is also the editor of the Journal of Chemical Physics. And I also would like to thank, thank him for new energy and also a lot of new ideas he's bringing with the journal. And with that, um, uh, Tim, it's your turn. Uh, why don't you start? Thank you, Soki. And Chris, for the invitation to speak at this wonderful workshop. Uh, since you mentioned JCP, I, I'm gonna take the liberty to invite all of you uh, to submit to JCP in either one of our regular, uh, as a regular paper or in many special issues that we are running. In fact, we do have a special issue now uh, that's ongoing um, charge and energy transfer at nanoscale. That's edited by uh, uh, quite a few experts in the field. So I welcome you to, uh, to check it out. Um, so in today's talk, I will tell you some of our recent work uh, in understanding extons in uh, colloidal two-dimensional materials. And this work is done really largely by a former PhD student, Chu Yang Li, now is a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia with Xiao Yan Zhu. Let me bring out my uh, laser pointer. So these materials are, are slightly different from uh, the, uh, the 2D material, monolayer material that Achana just spoke of. These, these are grown colloidally. So uh, cat selenite is a good example of those. They're typically a few monolayer in thickness from three to eight has been reported, uh, but they are precise. Um, uh, they grow essentially in a layer by layer fashion. So the thickness is uniform throughout a colloidal nano platelet. These are called platelets of typically tens of nanometer in, in width uh, and in length. And so as you can see down here in the, in the just absorption spectrum of these uh, material, you can see the A and B extons, and these are very, very sharp. And go, green is three monolayer and uh, uh, red is five monolayer. You see a very strong quantum confinement effect as you change the layer thickness. 
And so in a lot of um, talk I will, uh, in all the fi figures I will show later, I, I show this sort of very simplified uh, energy level diagram. Um, but that, that's mostly indicating the, the uh, band edge energy or energy level are dependent on the thickness. Of course, in the X, Y direction, in the lateral direction, uh, these carriers can move uh, freely or X down can move free. There is a dispersion relationship that I'm not talking about here or not, not explicitly saying, but that's something it's there. Uh, and a lot of early theoretic work of how to think about these material uh, can be found in this really nice paper by uh, Sasha Afros and others uh, in Nature Material. Uh, essentially in, this, in these material, external binding energy is very large, only order hundred, couple hundred milli electron volt. So at room temperature, you just think about these things moved as an electron hole pair. All right. Um, so in my, we actually have done a whole series of work on these materials uh, co uh, covering quite a few different topics. And many of them can be found um, in this uh, two uh, recent review articles. Uh, but in today's talk, I'm really gonna just talk about two things. One is the question of how big are the x tom in these materials? And the second thing is how does OJ recombination in these materials differ from uh, other low dimensional materials? So in terms of 2D x there are two important characteristics that we need to know, right? One is the internal motion. That's how electron moves relative to hole. And that is uh, pretty well understood uh, uh, in terms that it can be described by this 2D hydrogenic model. The other question turns out to be less well-known, at least to us anyway, uh, was how big are these exons? That, that is the motion of exon center mass. How big are they? The, the, the extent of coherent spatial area, how big are they? Uh, this is a very important question um, because it determines a lot of property of the exon, like the, the absorption strength, right? The bigger this um, space, coherent area, the stronger the oscillator strength that of course determine the radial decay rate. This of course affects how, how OJ recombination, how external moves and OJ recombination process. And this tying of course was all the application that requires this band edge extons. So the, our question is actually a very simple one. Uh, it has been discussed in the literature because these materials are atomically uh, precise in thickness. Therefore, the confinement energy is precise in the lateral direction. So that suggests that this exon can coherently delocalize over the whole nanoplatelet. So our question really is, is to just ask or measure how big is this exon on center of mass coherent area. And we will do that um, by transient absorption spectroscopy. So let me explain to you what we actually see in transient absorption spectroscopy. Um, so in this case, um, so in transient absorption, when you excite these exons, you will see an exon bleach. So showing in the lab here is a bleach of the exon. So the question is, what does this uh, exon bleach do to? There are two possible origins. One, these are all, of course, have to do with state filling, either due to state filling of the electron and all hole levels. And so in this experiment, uh, we actually try to uh, differentiate whether electron hole are the dominating contribution in this materials. So in this experiment, we actually add in an electron acceptor so we can remove the electron very selectively and very quickly uh, by this method biology. So showing here, down here, you can see the black curve is, this, is the spectrum at one at early time, one picosecond. You can see this exon bleach disappear very quickly. At the same time, you see the methyl biology radical shows up, that meaning the electron is transferred from cat nano sheet to methyl biology. And you can see this in the kinetics plot. So we just follow the recovery of the exon bleach, that's the black curve for a free nanoplatelet without methyl biology. And blue is the one with methyl biology. You can see the, the bleach recovers very quickly, indicating uh, electron transferred away. And at the same time, you can see the methyl biogen radical grows in. At the same time, bleach recover. And so that actually indicates, and so in fact, at later time, when the, when the radical is fully formed, you can see the exon bleach is all gone. That indicates that band edge exon bleach is actually dominated by electron state filling. 
So this is a, all the exon signal basically may tell you whether there's an electron in the conduction band edge. And this is negligible whole state filling. Uh, and th there, are, there are interesting reasons for that. One is to, due to the uh, degeneracy, larger degeneracy of the whole level. Second reason is due to whole trapping. So, so this issue has been examined more recently in a couple uh, papers, in, including work out of Lawrence Sibley's group, um, as well uh, our own work uh, in this nano letter paper that really go into detail. But, 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 the, but, the, but the main message for this material, you can, you can think of the electron state filling all uh, sort of the exon bleach signal, it just measures the electron. That is good and bad. It's good that it simplifies how we think about exon bleach. It's very simple, just measuring electron. The bad thing, of course, it does not tell you anything about a hole, or it doesn't tell you anything about the exon fine structure in this case. So we'll use this then to, this, however, does allow us to measure the degeneracy of the band edge electron state. And with that basically tell us the, the number of exon. So, so this is our early work, actually looking at quantum dot. Uh, we started with quantum dot because it's simpler. Uh, the band edge in the quantum, the quantum dot is fully confined all dimension. So the band edge state only had two fold degeneracy. So you know you can only put two electron in that band edge level. So here's a transient absorption spectrum again of quantum dot. Uh, again, showing at early time exon bleach is large, at later time is small. Right? In fact, it turns out to be about roughly half. And that's, that, that's actually important. So if we monitor this exon bleach amplitude at early time and later time and plot it as a function of excitation fluence or the average number of exons per quantum dot, you can see both signals grossing and then saturate, right? So the, the long time signal saturate to one. So that just means at long time, you can only have one exon. So that's by exon, no matter how many exon you generate, they annihilate at long time, go to one. And at early time, you can see the signal saturate to about two. And so this is monitoring band edge exon. So that means that in quantum dot, that band edge level is twofold degenerate. You can only put two exon at early time. Of course, there are higher energy exon, but we don't see that in this. But we know that at band edge, you can only accom accommodate two exons. So we can take the same idea now um, to uh, extend this measurement to nano playlet. Um, so uh, with exactly the same measurement. So here I show you a cartoon of a nano playlet. If, I, if the exon spatial area, right, it's only, it's roughly one third of the uh, area of the, of the quantum well, then in this experiment, I should see uh, the band edge, number of band edge exons should saturate as six, okay? Because the three, Essentially, you have a sort of three spatial area that can accommodate extons, and each exon is twofold degenerate. So that's our very simple model, and we're just going using transient absorption. We can measure the ratio of the early signal versus later signal that tells us how many extons uh, we had at the beginning. That's here's the data for it. So here's here's a whole set of here's a, here's one transient absorption spectrum at, at saturation fluence, and showing some showing feature very similar to what you see in quantum dots. So at early time, exon bleach is very large, and then over time it decays very quickly with time to some smaller amplitude. And it can be better seen in this kinetics plot where we just follow this amplitude as a function of time, and this time plotted in a log scale at long time. And so, at, so down here in the black curve, that is low fluence. So this is essentially a single exon. You can see this exon is long lived. As you increase the fluence, you, you are putting more and more exon in this nano platelet. And you can see its amplitude increases. Uh, and then there's a fast decay component you can see. And this is due to multi exon annihilation. Um, but very quickly, it will reach a saturation. You can see a high fluence, it saturates. And this is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, so as a cartoon, initially in this high fluence, all the exons, all the band edge exons are saturated. You already populate them. And then a longer time, they annihilate and, and only leave single exon. So we can simply read out the amplitude at early time, later time, and that tell us the ratio of, uh, of uh, that tell us the saturation number of exons in the system. 
this is a slide remind me to tell you it's not quite as simple as I said reading out. This of course had to be fitted because this exon bleach contains uh, multiple contributions. One of that is what we want, that's the state filling signal. But there are multi exon interactions that shift the exon band, all that had to be accounted for. I won't go into it, but that's in our paper. Uh, so with this technique, then uh, we basically look at uh, uh, four uh, a few different nanoplates of different thickness and lateral area. Uh, so here's the result that we got. Um, so the, here's a plot of the exon, uh, the nanoplate area versus number of extons. And so in this plot, the slope here essentially give you how big each uh, exon is. And on the right, it's just different plot of the same data. This just plot out the area of the exon. And so you can see when you go, when you add three monolayer, the spatial area of the exon is roughly about 140 nanometers square. Uh, when you go to five nanometer, it become quite a bit uh, smaller. So that's one, so that, that's one, uh, one thing we learned. Uh, the other thing we learned that's probably the most important part is this spatial area is smaller than the, ex, the, the quant, uh, uh, nanoplate area. So this exon does not, occupy the whole uh, nano sheet at this um, at room temperature. We took this, uh, we, we then extend the study to lower temperature. Um, so go, go all the way down to 2.6 Kelvin. And we show, and so, so, so the result on the right here, just plotting the area here of, of these uh, extons as a function of temperature. And on the right axis is a percentage of this, of the nanoplate area the exon occupies. So it goes from roughly about 50, 60% at room temperature to about 90%. So these exon spatial area does get bigger at low temperature and almost occupy the whole nano sheet. Okay. And this is this is this is suggestive of this giant oscillator strength effect that people have talked about in the literature. And that is because exon spatial area on uh, get bigger and the oscillator strength gets bigger, All right? The fact that at room temperature though, uh, this exon does not occupy to the whole nano shape. Then I ask the question, how do they move, right? It's, uh, do they move diffusively or as in a, in a ballistic way? So I don't have time to go into details, um, but just to, to, to show you one slide, the way we answer that question is just to generate, make nano heterostructures with this uh, nanoplatelet. So with cat sulfonide in the middle, cat sulfide outside. So in this experiment, we excite, generate exon in cat sulfide and watch how it moves because the exon transition energy difference, so we can follow this. The main message that we get out of this is this diffusion, this motion can be described by diffusive transport. And the diffusion constant is essentially bulk-like. It's actually very close to bulk diffusion constant. We think a factor of two or three, okay? So even though these things are, uh, are surrounded by ligands and colloidal solution, they move essentially as, like bulk crystals, right? That of course have consequences on OJ recombination. And that's what I want to talk about with the remaining uh, time I have. OJ recombination, for those of you not familiar, is a process uh, where uh, that occurs when you have multiple exon states. So what I, I'm showing here are two exons. And so then in this case, this, this one exon, this can recombine, right? By giving out its electron to a, uh, energy to a, to a third particle, either the third electron or hole, okay? A electron hole. And so this is a new recombination pathway, non-radiated recombination pathway that, that, that is not uh, available for single exon state. So as a result of that, as you make more and more exons, its lifetime gets shorter because of this OJ recombination. And this is a very important phenomenon to understand because many of the applications of these nano uh, crystals um, uh, require multi-exons like LED and laser for sure. And in our group, we were very interested in how to harvest multiple carriers to do photocatalysis. Um, OJ recombination in quantum dots has been very well understood. And really most of the early uh, work, uh, beautiful work, it's all done by Victor Klimov's group. 
And this, this graph summarizes much of that finding. It is, it is understood that the OJ recombination in quantum dots uh, follow this universe, universal volume scaling law. So let me explain what that is. So in bulk nano, in bulk crystals, uh, the different materials, like direct gap versus indirect gap material, for example, have very different OJ recombination time. You can see they change by many, many orders of magnitudes. However, uh, they found that in nanocrystals, uh, if you look at whole different type of nanocrystal, and this, this is all the symbols here, turns out the OJ recombination rate appear to be only depends on the radius of the particle, right? And so they propose, regardless whether it's direct or indirect gap material. So they propose this vol universal volume scaling law for OJ recombination. And there's good theoretical work to support that idea. What is surprising though, um, uh, when they look at nanorods um, in this early paper, let's sit on that nanorod, they also see this, uh, that by exton lifetime also scales with, with volume. Uh, so that's very surprising in the sense that the, the quantum confinement effect along the, along the uh, length and the diameter direction is very different for this nanorod, right? So, so that, uh, that begs the question whether this universal volume scaling law really uh, applicable in 1D and 2D uh, nanocrystals. This is actually a very difficult uh, question to answer uh, because it's very hard to prepare materials on uh, nanorods that, for example, as you just increase the length without changing the diameter, that's actually difficult to do. But these nanoplatelets, however, offers opportunity to do it because they are really, their thickness is well defined. They are either three, four or five monolayers. So as you grow them bigger, the thickness actually does not change. So now you have an opportunity to really just look at how they change with the area or, or thickness. So the, da so, we, so the data that we use to analyze this is actually all known, all, uh, all shown in the previous uh, study of exton space, spatial area. It's the same set of data, right? So if you look at, and I show, already show you this exton, um, uh, the exton bleach uh, recovery kinetics, at, as low fluence in the single exton state at long lift, as you go to higher fluence, you can see this, this appearance of this faster decay component. That's the multi exton annihilation. That's what we're going to analyze. So in this study, we just look at the lowest few uh, fluence. So at the lowest fluence, you can see this exton decay relatively slow, and that is the single exton state. When you go to slightly higher fluence, now you start to pick up this component and that by just simple subtraction, we can get out the bi exton decay. At this lowest fluence, it's dominated by a single exon and bi exon. Of course, there's a little bit of contribution of uh, 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 tri exon states too, uh, but this appeared to work quite well. So we just simply do the subtraction and get out this. You can of course fit this fluence dependent data to do it more rigorously, but, but uh, in our experiment, or by exon lifetime, this is actually fine. So the so if so we do this, we analyze this for all the different uh, nanoplatelets that we have for three monolayer, four monolayer, and five monolayer. And then for four four monolayer, we have the most um, difference in lateral size. So this data actually the two way you can look at this. So this is a plot of the by exon lifetime as a function of volume. So if you just look at volume you can see it does not follow the universal scale, scale, volume scaling law. In fact, it's very different for three, four, five monolayer of similar volume, their lifetime change by quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, are quite different. However, if you just look at the four monolayer data, you can see indeed it scales, right? With the volume. So what that really means is scale with the area, okay? So, so you should plot this data then. Uh, so we plot this data as a function of the lateral area. And so this four nanolayer, uh, so this, in, in this view then, we will argue then that by exon lifetime scales, scales area in a linear way. And for different thickness, they have a different scaling law. So that's our interpretation of the data. All right. uh, the other thing I should mention though, uh, the, all these by exon lifetime is actually a lot larger than if you just think about quantum dot, and that's because they have a much larger area for the exon to move around. So, 
we develop a model to analyze this. And this is actually um, uh, uh, borrowed from a earlier work by Tony Hines and, and co-workers, where they look at nano, carbon nanotube. They look at by exon recombination in carbon nanotube. And this is essentially a biomolecular collision model. So in this picture, exons move and when they collide, there is a chance for OJ recombination. So in this model, then by exon recombination rate should scale with collision frequency. And then the probability of OJ recombination per collision. The collision frequency uh, for this type of, uh, in this morphology, you can show is, is proportional to one over A, the area. That's just, that just a matter of, uh, just a measure of the, of the collision rate essentially, okay? And the, so, so we will argue then that, that what we see here by exon OJ recombination times proportion, the, the fact is linear proportional to the lateral area of nanoplatelet, it's just simply a, a reflection of this collision frequency. Um, so the other aspect of this theory then is the OJ probability per collision. That's a little harder. Um, so this is where we actually look at literature in quantum well. There are quite a bit of work in bulk quantum well materials where people show for a certain, for this particular recombination pathway, OJ recombination pathway, that is the electron recombined by exciting the electron, um, that scaling, this OJ probability scales with this to the energy to the seven and a half power. Now don't ask me what the, why that's seven and a half, but that's how theory work out to be. So we just simply adopt that to, 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 to our data. So, uh, so the confined energy seven and a half indicates is proportional to the diameter to, to minus to seven power. So we can replot our data in that form and all these data actually falls into very nice line. So we are quite convinced that this, this is the scaling law for OJ recombination in this material. Uh, is, it should be inverse to area, uh, lateral area and then the thickness in a very much steeper uh, scaling. I should say though, um, Iran Robani's group actually did a very nice computational study on this, on this very similar system, although it was much smaller area. And they actually show, see a very different scaling law for the thickness. It's, not, it's nowhere close to the, uh, uh, to the seventh power. So I don't fully understand the discrepancy here. There's a lot more work to be done. So, so let me summarize this. So, so in, 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 in three dimensionally quantum confined system, so that's the quantum dots, volume scaling law appear to work very well. So in 2D nanoplatelet, we believe that volume scaling law does not work. That is a, the scaling law for the, for the quantum confined, that the thickness direction and the non-quantum confined direction should be very different. And so, right? And then quantum, in a non-quantum confined on the three dimension, that's easy to understand. To us, that's just collision frequency should, should scale as a to the minus one. We believe this idea should work for nanorods. So this nanorod data can also be understood in this way. So this volume dependence really just met, it's just a dependence on the length. If you keep the diameter the same, and it should be minus one based on this collision argument. All right. Suki, uh, I don't know how, I, how I'm doing time. Do I have any more time? I'm done. Um. Yeah, you have used up all your time. So okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Minute, yeah, three minutes left for questions and discussion. Yeah, so let me yeah. just wrap up. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I hope I give you a, a, a sense, um, a, a, a quick taste of, of some of the work we have done. Uh, so we believe in this colloidal quantum um, confined nanoplatelet materials uh, at room temperature, exon does not, uh, size does not quite occupy the whole nanoplatelet, at least for nanoplatelet 100 uh, nanometer square, for example. Uh, but at room temp as you go to lower temperature, the exon delocalize, and we show that OJ recombination in these materials do not follow uh, the universal volume scaling law. They scale very differently in the quantum confined, non quantum confined dimension. With that, I will end. Uh, I will just end here uh, by thanking you for your attention. Thank you. Right, again, very nice talk. Uh, Tim, 
so I think we have time for a couple questions. The, the first one is from the private chat. And I, you may have addressed this already, but just in, in terms of um, diffusion constant and quenching radius, sort of the traditional constants that people use to discuss exciton, exciton annihilation in, in, in other systems. You know, do you have a feeling, I guess, for, for what those values are in, in, this, in these platelets? Yeah, so diffusion constant is basically bulk-like. Uh, so the bulk diffusion constant, so we measure that and we show it, it's very close to bulk value. We think a factor of two or three. Now the area, uh, I don't actually know how to think about it. Let me, I had to think about this for a second here. This is, so we don't know, we don't have a specific. Uh, so mm -hmm. in this, we just look for the scaling law mm -hmm. in this, uh, in terms of the uh, lateral area. But in principle, it is in that model, right? In the how big this exon, but we, we have not pulled that out. Mm -hmm. uh, while we didn't have the confidence to pull it out, mm -hmm. we were just looking for how it scale with the area. So in principle, it might actually be in this model. Okay, okay I think that's reasonable. Um, okay, do you see, uh, this is from Vinod, do you see any evidence of excited states of excitons? I guess in your experimental data? Excited state exon, that's basically by extons. Is that is that is that what we're thinking? By exon tri exon? Uh, could yeah. be. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, that's the question. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking more like the Rydberg series. Oh, 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 oh. like the single exon state, like higher, higher single exon state. Um, yeah. we 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 don't. I think it's not obvious in the absorption spectrum, we can't see it. And then it, yeah, we don't, um, or we, we really haven't looked at. So I know there's this beautiful work out of the Columbia group where they use that to, to, to very good uh, effect. Uh, we have not analyzed the absorption spectrum in any detailed way to pull that out. I'm trying to go to it. Yeah, we, we have not. Okay, I think- Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks for the question. I'm, I, unfortunately, I, because Suggy's the organizer, his questions get <laughs> short shrift, but they're in the chat. And so I encourage you, and actually Archana as well, if you guys, if you guys want to look at the chat, there are still a few extra questions there. But I think we'll move, thanks, Tim. Uh, we'll move to uh, the next Tim <laughs> Berkelbeck from Columbia. Okay, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Suggy, for the invitation and also for organizing what's been a really nice Zoom series. This will be a uh, talk slightly different than the ones before, focusing on some theoretical work that we've been doing in our group to understand um, excitons largely in two-dimensional materials. So I had a feeling that Archinano was going to do a lot of the work for me in introducing some of the things I wanted to talk about today. And indeed, I'll, I'll talk mostly, maybe half and half, uh, first about transition metal dihalogenides, things like molybdenum disulfide. And then in the second half, I'll talk about the um, lead halide perovskites. So just very quickly, molybdenum disulfide or the transition metal dihalogenides are layered two-dimensional uh, semiconductors. And for the purposes of this talk, the most important thing I just want to emphasize is that purely by looking at something like the absorption spectrum, you can clearly tell that excitons are going to be important in understanding electronic and optical properties of these materials. So Archana already pointed out the sort of proposal of environmental sensitivity in atomically thin materials. And so in fact, I wanna motivate some of the work I'll describe uh, by work that we were involved in, but that was really led by Archana uh, a couple of years ago with the idea of what I think at the time we called Coulomb engineering. And so if I just think of some simple cartoon of an exciton in a two-dimensional material, I can draw the electron in the hole and uh, kind of like a dipole that uh, electron hole pair has electric field lines. And many of those electric field lines penetrate into the surroundings of the two-dimensional material. So, this suggests that the environment's dielectric properties might impact the Coulomb interactions of electrons within the material. And in that way, you can modify the environment and uh, ultimately change the electronic properties of this atomically thin material. So the actual experiment that was done 
was to test uh, bare monolayer tungsten disulfide uh, and then ask what happens if you cap that material by uh, a couple of layers of graphene. And again, just at this cartoon level, we could think that the electric field lines now need to go through this graphene. Graphene being a semi-metal is quite polarizable. So this might uh, do a more efficient job of screening the Coulomb interaction. And by screening the Coulomb interaction, you'll change the excitonic properties of the material. Right, and so this is on one hand, a cool idea of trying to do uh, environmental sensing. You could think maybe I'll make measurements on the tungsten disulfide and those measurements will tell me something about the local environment. So it's like a sensor or vice versa. I can use the environment as a way to modify or tune the properties of this two-dimensional material, which is a very non-invasive way to tune um, semiconductor properties, right? I don't need to introduce um, dopants or defects or things like that. So it's a really tantalizing idea. Like I said, this was done experimentally. So this will be uh, measured spectra for a single layer of tungsten disulfide. And then that spectrum will be compared in red to a measured spectrum of tungsten disulfide covered by two layers of graphene, like in the cartoon here. So this is what they found. Uh, blue is just regular tungsten disulfide. Like I said, very strong peaks at the onset of absorption. So clearly excitons are what are important. Uh, and when measured, uh, as capped by graphene, there is a shift in the spectrum. So this is great. It's like proof of concept. This really does work. The spectrum is modified just by a few atoms thick worth of material nearby. The magnitude of the shift is not massive. So it's 30 milli electron volts, which maybe is big depending on uh, your point of view. But at the time, we thought that that was kind of small. And so this collaboration that we were involved in really set um, me and my graduate student, Young Su Cho, on the, the goal of trying to develop a quantitative theory that would predict what magnitude of a change should one expect when you modify the dielectric environment of atomically thin materials. So I'm actually going to tell the conclusion first, and then I'll walk through some of the technical theory details. Um, and it's a story that I think many of us already appreciate. And the point is that it's really competing effects that determine excited state energies that would be measured in something like absorption or photoluminescence. So let me think of just the, the bulk phase of a transition metal dicalcogenide. Uh, it has a ground state. And then somewhere up here, higher in energy will be the band gap. And here by band gap, I mean the quasi-particle band gap or the charge gap, the thing that would be measured by um, photoemission, the difference of an ionization potential and electron affinity or, or tunneling measurements. And at that band gap, there's kind of a, a continuum of excited states above it. But in the presence of Coulomb interactions, there are neutral excited states. So the types of states that are prepared or measured by uh, things like absorption. Uh, and there's typically a set of bound states below this band gap. And I'll just for the sake of terminology, say that the energy to the lowest lying one could be called an optical gap, just to distinguish it from the band gap. Um, and really, I think the states here are kind of the Rydberg series that Vinod you know, was asking about. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit in this talk. And this difference between the band gap and the optical gap is what um, is typically called the exciton binding energy. And of course, many of us know that in nanoscale materials, exciton binding energies can be quite large. And that's uh, one part of why they're interesting electronically. So the point for the purpose of trying to understand this environmental sensitivity is if I think about going from a bulk transition metal dicalcogenide to the monolayer limit, really two things happen. One is that the band gap increases, but at the same time, the magnitude of the exciton binding energy also increases. And this happens in such a way so that their changes almost cancel one another and leave the lowest lying excited state or the optical gap relatively unchanged. And this is even what you already see experimentally in comparing uh, the onset of absorption, perhaps not the actual spectral structure, but the onset of absorption between bulk and monolayer transition metal dicalcogenides are very, very similar. And so this also extends now to the idea of putting a monolayer on top of a substrate. That substrate can do some efficient screening, but again, these two competing effects take place. The band gap will get uh, reduced a little bit from the monolayer limit, 
the exciton binding energy's magnitude will also be reduced a little bit. And again, this happens in such a way to leave the optical gap relatively unchanged. So that's the qualitative take home. In seeking to make this into a, a quantitative theory, you need to address both of these two competing effects. So one of them is changes to the band gap due to um, either atomically thin structuring or uh, the presence of a substrate. And then the second is the actual exciton binding process itself. So let me first talk about uh, step one, which is the renormalization or changes to the band gap. And really, I'm going to think about this in the context of how is the bulk band gap modified? So from a theory point of view, it's saying, you tell me the bulk band gap, which is both relatively easy to measure and to calculate. And then I'll ask, how is that band gap changed if I go to the monolayer limit and if I put that monolayer on a substrate? And so when we think about changes to band gaps in going from bulk to atomically thin or nanostructured materials, I think the picture that most of us actually have in mind is sort of the quantum confinement effect, which is really a kinetic energy effect. Right, so this is very much what's taking place in things like cad sulfide, cad selenide, including nanoplatelets that Tim just talked about. Right, I have bulk cad selenide. When I make it into a quantum dot, I have particle in a box phys particle in a box physics. Band gaps will increase. All of that kind of thing take place. In fact, in two D or van der Waals materials, that's really not what's the most important physics. The reason, uh, which is something that Archana mentioned in her talk, is there's very weak interlayer hybridization, especially between orbitals uh, of the transition metal atom. So at the K point in the Brillouin zone, which is the, the transition that we're mostly interested in for these materials, the transition metal D orbitals, so the orbitals sitting on the blue atoms shown here, hybridize very, very poorly with the transition metal D atoms in the next layer because they're insulated by all of these calcogen atoms. So when you go from bulk to monolayer, at least at that special point in the Brillouin zone, you don't really lose any kinetic energy. So there's not a, a, a big difference in the band gap. So the thing that is important is in fact a dielectric effect. It's not a kinetic energy or, or this carrier confinement. You can think of it as a potential energy effect. And that's just saying that electrons in a monolayer material experience a very different dielectric environment and one that is heterogeneous. In some hand-waving sense, the dielectric constant is quite large within the monolayer material and very small outside of the monolayer material. So you can calculate this um, in a couple of different ways. The one that we've been using, you can really think of it as like a born salvation energy, maybe for people who are familiar with the term from like biophysics or, or solution phase physical chemistry. Um, it's also a very simple version of what's called the GW approximation from a, a theory point of view. So it, it's like a self-energy, and in practice, the way it needs to be calculated is as a certain limit of the difference between two potential energies for um, interactions between electrons uh, in materials. So I just need these two Coulomb interactions, W of R, which need to be aware of screening. And then I take their difference, and I take some special limit. So the um, one of these Coulomb interactions that I need is for the bulk material. And despite being electronically anisotropic, the screening in bulk materials is actually reasonably isotropic. And so to a good approximation, that Coulomb interaction is just 1 over R screened by some dielectric constant epsilon, where in, in TMDC is epsilon something like 14. And so now to complete this formula, I just need to know what's the, the Coulomb interaction or, or some potential energy for interactions between electrons in the monolayer. So we model that just as a slab. So it's a slab of some thickness D. That uniform slab has dielectric constant epsilon 1. And then for the model, we assume that there's dielectric constants epsilon 2 below and 3 above. And that just sets up some special Poisson equation that can be solved by image charges. So when you do both of these two things, take their difference and evaluate this R goes to 0 limit, which is really doing a, a born salvation energy calculation. Uh, you get an expression for the change in the band gap, so the change from bulk in going to a monolayer or a monolayer um, supported by a substrate with dielectric constants that has the expression that I'm showing you here. And I'm really showing this expression, one, just to impress Adam Willard, uh, but also, two, just because it's 
cute that it's entirely closed form. So we almost never get access to like closed form expressions in theory. Um, but all you need to know are just these parameters. I told you the thickness of your, your atomically thin material and the dielectric constants of that material and its environment. And you can just plug in and this will tell you the change in the band gap from the bulk limit. So I can show you what that looks like. Uh, this is plotting the energy of the band gap of MOS2 as a function of the dielectric constant of the substrate. And I assume nothing above. And so you can see this is something that does change a lot. This is something that is very sensitive to the environment. In the sort of suspended monolayer limit, the band gap of MOS2 is quite large. It's like 2.6 or 2.7 EV. But if you put it on a substrate and that substrate's dielectric constant increases, you can see that the band gap will drop um, and it can get as low as something like 2 EV for, let's say, reasonable substrates. I'm not going to go into details, but we can now also calculate the exciton binding energy using a um, hydrogen-like Bonnier equation. Um, we heard before that from Tim that the relative motion of the electron in the hole is reasonably well understood in terms of these quasi 2D hydrogen models. And that's what we use here to, to calculate the binding energy using the same uh, sort of image charge solution of the screen Coulomb interaction that I mentioned before. So now when you combine these two things, the band gap and the exciton binding energy in order to try to predict the optical gap, the thing that you would see in absorption, uh, you get the red dashed line here, which like I told you qualitatively is very independent of the substrate dielectric constant. Um, and over this range, it changes by something like, I don't know, 0.1 EV or 0.2 EV or so. So this is the very small change uh, that we saw in those very early experiments by our channel. Uh, we talked earlier about excited states of the exciton. So the fact that this looks like the hydrogen atom means that there are uh, sort of Rydberg type excited states. So the notation is that the first one is typically called 1s, the next bright one is typically called 2s. And that has um, a dependence on the dielectric constant that is somewhere in between the two. So it's this blue dashed line here. And it's kind of sensitive to the environment. And it's potentially easier to measure than band gaps, because in materials, you need to do something like inverse photo emission or, again, some kind of tunneling measurement to get access to the conduction band. So the 2S, if you can see it in linear spectroscopies, um, is a reasonably useful probe of local dielectric environment. So that, this was some of the work and the prediction that we did in 2018. Uh, just in case you think that the theory is complete BS, um, here, whoa, here in uh, circles are just showing you the results from an ab initio GW beta saltpeter calculation for a suspended monolayer with no substrate. And so you can see that the agreement is really quite good. And now you can just very simply extend all of these results into finite substrate dielectric constant without having to repeat these otherwise expensive calculations. So like I said, those were predictions in 2018 and in 2019, again, highlighting some of Archana's nice work uh, in Tony Heinz's group, they basically did those calculations, they did those measurements. So they measured the 1S state in um, linear spectroscopy and the 2S state for tungsten disulfide supported on hexagonal boron nitride and on graphite. So, HBN has a smaller substrate dielectric constant. Uh, so that's the orange points here. This is the 1S state. This is the 2S state. Uh, and in blue on graphite with a higher dielectric, uh, here's 1S. The change is very small. But here's 2S, and the change is quite large. And I also show you this author list just to convince you that we were not a part of this study. And so it was really nice to see um, confirmation of these predictions. OK, so that's a little bit of the story I wanted to tell about transition metal dicocogenides as really atomically thin 2D materials. Uh, and now I'm going to shift gears for the rest of the talk and discuss the lead halide perovskites. So I'm sure I don't need to do a ton of introduction. The bulk 3D phase of these organic, inorganic lead halide perovskites you know, are being studied by many people right now, especially in the context of solar energy. These have been very appealing. Obvious pros are that their band gap is pretty much in the visible where you'd like it to be for solar, and they have 
relatively high carrier mobilities, which is sort of an interesting theoretical question that I'm not going to touch today. The obvious cons, one is the presence of lead. So there's a lot of nice work going on to try to understand how to replace the lead in these perovskites. Um, but the one that matters for my talk is uh, their stability with respect to air and moisture. And so despite wanting to stay as far away from the perovskites as possible for a long time, I learned that one can address this issue of stability in the perovskites by going to quasi two-dimensional versions. So there are these layered lead halide perovskites that you can think of as alternating inorganic organic layers. Uh, so here's the inorganic octahedra. They're separated by these organic barriers, and then they repeat inorganic, organic, inorganic. And really incredible synthetic work has made it possible to tune the thickness of the inorganic parts of these materials. So uh, these are also called, this is mostly the Ruddleston popper phase of the perovskites for people who are familiar. And the notation in that field is to use this um, little n to indicate basically how many inorganic octahedra are in each of these layers. So this is what we would call n equals one. It's the thinnest. Uh, and then there's n equals two, n equals three, and you can really go basically up to the bulk. So because this is now sort of 2D physics and we had some expertise there, we finally decided to get involved a little bit in the, in the lead halide perovskites. The problem from a computational point of view is that as you go to like n equals two, three, four, these have extremely large unit cells. And large unit cells are a challenge for first principles calculations. So density functional theory would be non-trivial. And then things like uh, GW or BSC are, are basically prohibitive. So we've developed a, a tight binding model and some approximate solution of um, the GW BSE equations that I won't spend a ton of time going into. Uh, for people who are interested, it, it starts from doing a bulk band structure calculation, so the 3D isotropic material. Uh, and then we do a Vanier type tight binding model construction to produce a real space type binding model using only the lead 6s and 6p orbitals and say iodine 5s and 5p orbitals. So this now gives a real space model of the electronic structure from a bulk calculation. And we can use that real space type binding model now and transfer it right into uh, quasi 2D versions. So if I go back to, to our discussion about transition metal dichalcogenides and what influences excitation energies, the, the 2D perovskites are actually kind of interesting because the confinement effect, the particle in a box type physics, is present in these materials. right? So if I look at n equals 3 versus 2 versus 1, there is strong covalent bonding, large hybridization between these inorganic sublayers in the z direction. So as I go from 3 to 2 to 1, there really is a, a particle in the box confinement type effect, unlike in, in van der Waals materials. And there's a dielectric contrast effect. I have a relatively high dielectric constant in the inorganic part and a relatively low dielectric constant in the organic part. And so this contrast is also going to tune the Coulomb interaction uh, that uh, electrons inside the inorganic layer experience. So we do almost exactly the same trick I described before. We have some thickness for each layer. They're assigned dielectric constants, and we can do GW style band gap corrections. So just to show you what that looks like, this is the band structure of n equals one, two, three, up to four um, of these oct inorganic octahedra. And really just the fact that these calculations can be done uh, is because of all of the simplifications I've described before. The band structures themselves are not so interesting, so I'll just go straight to the absorption spectra that we can now calculate using this approximate solution of the beta Sawpeter equation. Um, and for the thinnest 2D perovskites, what are called n equals one, uh, we have some very strong absorption around two and a half eV. In gray here, I'm just highlighting that there are uh, Rydberg type states, 2s, 3s, at slightly higher energy that, that we could point out and talk about. And as you increase the thickness, as you would, I think, intuitively expect, the excitation energy does go down. The intensity of the absorption also goes down. Um, but again, things like 2s and 3s could be found and, and discussed. So this style of plotting was not accidental. And in fact, um, about a year prior to us doing those calculations, 
these spectra had been measured experimentally in this very nice paper here. Um, and with something close to zero free parameters, um, our calculation agrees with these measured spectra really quite well. And just because Vinod had asked about it, uh, here they do hint at the presence of these 2S, 3S type states. In almost all of these sort of quasi 2D materials, you really have to squint in order to find them. Typically, one takes like derivatives to try to enhance their features in, in spectra, but they are there. Um, and what's nice is from the from the calculation, we can pick apart all of the contributions to the excitation energy. So if I think about them as uh, corrections to the bulk band gap, which is about 1.7 EV for the lead halide perovskites, then there is a very large carrier confinement effect. Again, just particle in a box that raises the band gap that's going from green to this big orange shaded region. On top of this confinement effect, there is an additional dielectric contrast effect that raises the band gap even more. That's the yellow region, which gives the band gap itself in the black symbols. And then the exciton binding energy reduces this band gap, and it does so with the blue striped region to give the first excitation energy, which are the red squares. So like the 2D sort of van der Waals materials, the dielectric contrast and the exciton binding energy almost cancel one another, but the sort of thickness dependence of the confinement energy, which is present in perovskites, but not in um, the van der Waals materials, does leave a relatively strong thickness dependence in the excitation energy. So we've pushed these types of theories in other directions that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, but one is we've used them to calculate the binding energy of trions, so three particle species and bi-excitons, two electrons and two holes. Uh, this was done using relatively sophisticated uh, numerical techniques. You can see that bi-exciton binding energies are a little bit larger than trion binding energies. And as you would expect, both of them do go down as you increase uh, the number of these inorganic octahedra. They are comparable to what's seen in monolayers of the transition metal dicalcogenides. They are also larger than room temperature, especially on the, the thinner side, which means that they should be or could be observed experimentally. And at least at n equals one, this error bar shows the range of experimentally reported by exciton binding energies, which have been observed. We've also extended these methods to calculate um, nanocrystals which have been studied a lot as well for lead halide perovskites. So these are now zero D, um, but we can go from very small nanocrystals to simulating the absorption spectra of reasonably large nanocrystals. And really we can now access sizes to connect to experiments. So this, you know, I sort of thought of this when uh, Tim mentioned the challenge of comparing uh, their experimentally reported work with uh, computations. If the sizes are so, so different, it becomes very hard to do a fair comparison. But all of these sort of uh, cost saving approximations that we've made to produce a physically reasonable theory lets us actually make connection with experiment. Um, and so some experts might know that there's a lot of um, interest in the fine structure of excitons at the, the onset of absorption in these lead halide perovskites. And so we've been uh, looking into that as well. So with that, let me wrap up. I'm not going to mention some work that we've been doing to remove all of the sort of physical intuition that we need to put into these models because it's a bit laborious. We've been trying to make this more black box by developing a, a semi-empirical, but again, um, needs no tuning uh, version of the GW approximation. It's very cheap compared to first principles calculations. Um, and let me just thank the people who did this work so almost everything that I've talked about today was done by my student, Youngsoo Cho. Uh, the work on trions and biexitons was done uh, by Youngsoo in collaboration with my student, Sam Green. And the work on nanocrystals was done uh, with a visiting graduate student, Julia Biffy, from uh, the Italian Institute of Technology. Let me thank some of the experimental collaborators who we've worked with um, and the funding source for most of this research. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, Tim, uh, we have time for a few questions. And so I will just jump right into those questions. The first one again is a private question. Uh, do you expect the phonon effect in, in the two-dimensional uh, transition metal dicalcogenides 
to offset the dielectric effect and thus lead to similar exciton binding for 2D in the bulk. So basically, what about the effects of phonons? What about the effects of phonons is a great question and a hard one to answer. My personal feeling is that for the uh, transition metal dicarcogenides, um, well, let's say there's a zero temperature electron phonon renormalization to the band gap, which maybe is what the person's asking about. Absolutely, that's important. It's not included here. So a fair comparison to experiment, one would like to include that. I think the cancellation of the effects we talked about here still hold, but indeed there might be another renormalization due to phonons that I did not talk about. I think in the lead halide perovskites, it's even more complicated because those materials are very soft and very disordered. So we're doing all of this sort of electronic structure, assuming a perfect rigid lattice. It's known that these uh, the, the nuclear dynamics are very important and how to build that in is something we're thinking about, but it's uh, really a challenge there. Another question, the local, how about local field effects to uh, enhance the binding energy of the exciton? We've looked into local field effects and they're, they don't seem to be a massive, they don't make a massive difference. So they are probably a quantitative effect, but qualitatively not, maybe even semi-quantitatively not. Um, you know, just as one data point, you can compare the predictions of our model to those ab initio GW beta saltpeter equation calculations for a suspended monolayer. And we're within a 10th of an EV of those results those being fully atomistic have all local field effects included. Okay, and then one quick question from Arcana. Uh, can you give us a sense of the frequency dependence of the binding energy, which would take into account the effects of phonons and free carriers? Um, you, uh, frequency depends on the binding energy. I'm um, not quite sure. You know, frequency dependence of the dielectric function is absolutely that, something that we're leaving out here. Yeah, that's what um, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I think I think that's what that, that's what I meant. The effect of the frequency dependence, yeah. the screening. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, even from first principles calculations, it's known that the frequency dependence is not super important for lots of semiconducting and insulating materials with large exciton binding energies. So I think the 2D transition metal dicarcogenides, as an example, are probably safely in that regime. The 3D bulk perovskites having a relatively small exciton binding energy, it might be more important to think about the interaction between this small energy scale that is the exciton binding energy and relatively important uh, nuclear dynamics on similar frequencies. But again, I think as you go to the 2D perovskites, you get back into this sort of safe uh, large exciton binding energy limit where there's a time scale or frequency separation that makes it relatively safe to do static screening, which is everything that we're doing here. Um, yeah, I guess uh, it sort of goes back to the phonon question as well. So uh, okay. they'll have contributions to the screening. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, I think we're, I, we'll have to wrap it up there to sort of stay on time. So I want to thank you again, Tim, for a great talk. And then our next and last speaker is from the physics department at University of California, Riverside, and that's Nathan Gabor. And he's going to give us yeah, maybe a more physics perspective on some of the some of the exciton physics in 2D materials. So Nathan? So yeah, uh, first of all, thank, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, join this, this group. And I should also thank all of the other speakers because they've really kind of taken a, a little bit of my intro away by allowing me to kind of review some of what they've already said, which is actually really important because I want to do, I do want to give a physics perspective. Um, and what I'll talk about is basically kind of one really unique aspect of exotons, which is that they can assume other phases beyond kind of the single exciton picture. And you've already seen some of this, but I want to put it in a slightly different perspective. We now all know that these excitons live in these kind of two-dimensional membranes. And when we think of their field lines, those field lines go out of the membrane and so they can be dominated at, by, the, by the actual surrounding. So we've talked a lot about this. You've heard a lot about it today. Um, I wanna give you a, a simple perspective then because it allows us, it gives us a way to think simply. And one thing you can imagine doing is plotting the energy per electron hole pair as a function of the average electron hole separation. And this is a normal way to think of, of potential energy diagrams. Um, and you're all familiar with it, right? We have the free charge carriers at the top. They don't really care about 
uh, the, the separation between electron and hole. By definition, they're, they're free. Um, but when we have excitons, we basically have now a, a local potential well that's defined by what we all call the Bohr radius. And again, we, we've, we've said a lot about this. And one key question that you should ask and has come up is why do we care? And one of the reasons, one of the most fundamental reasons I think that technologists care about these materials is that a lot of the physics is happening at room temperature. So for instance, the binding energies like we've seen is several hundred million electron volts. That puts it at many, many times KT at room temperature. And so this is a really important aspect of what I'm gonna talk about, but I think it, as a technologist, this is also really important because it takes some of the physics that was well known to condensed matter at very low temperatures and brings it up to kind of room temperature physics. And one way to look at this, and this also came up in a, in a lot of what we've heard is how do we excite these uh, excitons, but then how do they interact when they get at high densities? And this is where we start to think about exciton, exciton annihilation, Auger-like processes. Um, but, but what I do want to say is that none of this is, is all that new in the sense that even in the 70s, uh, some solid state theorists were thinking a lot about two-dimensional membranes and how the carriers would interact in, in, these, in these membranes. And one of them that I'll talk about today is Leonid Keldish, who pointed out some very interesting aspects of the, the kind of critical length scales of excitons and how they interact. And, and he was one of the people who really began to understood these two-dimensional excitations. And he basically laid out two length scales. One was the Bohr radius, so kind of how close the electron and hole live to one another. But the other was kind of the inter-exciton spacing. So if I had two, you know, how close can they get before the whole entire exciton picture breaks down, right? You could imagine that if I get close enough, I now have interactions between say an electron in one and a hole in the other. And so this, this becomes really a really kind of critical point in our understanding. And so, like I said, I, I think it's good to point out that there were some uh, very uh, well understood works even long ago. I think now we're very lucky to be able to play games and do experiments with it. And that's where, what's really has changed. So again, another thing that's been kind of discussed in the, in the talks prior is that we've been thinking in the field a lot about how these excitons are formed um, but also about what happens as we kind of in, in, increase the, the exciton density. Um, and so we, we now look at most of this work as kind of a dilute exciton gas. A lot of the previous work and a lot of under normal optical kind of conditions, we think of this as a dilute exciton gas. But there is work, as we heard, and, and much more besides, to look at how that gas changes when you start to increase the density. And this is where you start to see the onset of exciton-exciton interactions. And, and this is where you might see annihilation uh, or Auger physics. This had been established in quantum dots. It had been established in carbon nanotubes. So, so this kind of progression as your density goes up uh, is well understood. What, what became unique in the 2D materials um, is that at room temperature, there were many uh, publications that gave evidence of what looked like many body effects. So forming more kind of exotic multi-exciton states where you actually reach densities uh, where even the kind of exciton-exciton annihilation picture doesn't work. You're basically creating something perhaps, uh, you know, there's, there's even language for these things, these kind of four or five, six particle states, droplets, right? And the question that we've been interested in, in the field, but also certainly in my lab, is can we actually drive a non-equilibrium phase transition. So can we push these excitons to such a density that they change phase? Now, one barrier to that, it's, it was actually, it's still well studied in carbon nanotubes, is that it could be that we can't ever reach another phase because exciton-exciton annihilation can be so efficient that the density will never reach the density to go through kind of a Mott transition. So this was still a mystery up until a few years ago, but it's a really important question is, can we see kind of a dynamic phase transition between gas and some higher density state? And this is what we've been really interested in my group. So um, as we all heard, we, we can stack and twist. There's many degrees of freedom in these materials. Uh, this was a paper that I wrote with a colleague in Singapore, Justin Song, where we kind of laid out what we feel was the direction that this field would go. When you have the ability to stack precisely the materials you want 
and twist them to change the kind of small scale atomic structure, you're really left with a big challenge, which is uh, you're in a wide open field of new phenomena that will probably emerge. Um, and I, I think there are many other reviews. And I think what, what people have been talking about today are kind of in line with this idea that it's like a new era of being able to engineer uh, pretty complex heterostructures. And so in my lab, we're doing some, some straightforward, we're in the kind of baby steps of, of this, this worldview. Um, and I think I, I, the, the main point is that these heterostructures do provide a very rich environment to explore excitons, but also all, all sorts of other physics, like the correlated states, like superconductivity observed in Pablo's lab and, and, and other things that we've heard about. So let me, let me go right to what we're after. Um, we actually started studying a, a very simple structure that uses uh, graphene essentially as a device contact, um, a few layer molybdenum telluride, which is an infrared active uh, semiconductor, but then we would top it with another layer of graphene. And what we were actually interested in doing in this material was studying the, the photophysics, but in a device architecture. And so what we do is we bring in a, a focused laser beam, just like we would do in kind of a PL measurement. Um, but we're using a pulsed kind of 200 femtosecond infrared laser beam. And what we're measuring, instead of looking at light out in any form, either transmission or absorption or, or luminescence, um, we're basically looking at the current that we generate between the, the two layers of graphene. So one of the things my lab specializes in is, is looking at these photocurrent measurements. And we knew a little bit about MOTE2. It has kind of a one electron volt band gap. So it, in some sense, is kind of a, an energy scale that, that device physics people like because it looks a, a bit like silicon. Um, it, it had been shown to have a very high photoresponsivity. So some other previous work had shown that this material for some reason was just a good photoconductor. And it showed some evidence of efficient exciton exciton annihilation. So we knew that it was a material in which uh, interactions between excitons were important. And so this was really a, 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 the kind of the target that we chose because of all, of all of these reasons. Now I'm gonna tell you about some of these photocurrent measurements, but I think it's important to kind of point out the distinction of this measurement to what you might see kind of in a typical photoluminescence uh, spectroscopy. So we basically devise a system. This is a picture of the, the low temperature system. This can operate at, at four Kelvin. Um, it's, a, it's a high vacuum system where the device kind of sits down in the, in the base of a, an optical cryostat probe station. Um, and the way we've done this, in order to get a magnetic field in there, to do this at low temperature, uh, and to do ultra-fast optics, we actually had to innovate a little bit to include what's called a gradient index of refraction lens. It's a tiny little lens that focuses our light near the surface, um, but it allows us to get in this tiny little footprint where the device sits, uh, one of the main optics to, to focus our light down on the sample. And what we're using is a kind of typical pump probe measurement where we're taking a pulse at t equals zero, and then we have a time delayed pulse that we can tune with a delay stage. So it's a very typical kind of uh, time delay measurement, but we're measuring the uh, photocurrent. And just to show you for all the experimental geeks out there like me, um, we were actually able to get this kind of ultra fast uh, autocorrelation at the laser specification on the sample in a, in a can that can be measured at four Kelvin uh, under a four Tesla magnetic field. So we were able to basically bring ultra fast pulses into the device uh, quite well. Um, and to, to our knowledge, it's one of the best performing systems that does this. Though there are other people that have done it, we've used this uh, tiny little lens to actually optimize that system. Um, so, so the basic measurement proceeds as follows. And I'm gonna walk through the measurement so that you can see how we do this, but then also to kind of get a little bit of an insight into our thinking. So we, we bring this probe beam in and we form this sandwich as I showed you. So it's graphene, MOT2 graphene. And we measure the current that flows when we shoot the laser. And the laser is hitting on the resonance of the exciton in this few layer MOT2. And the basic measurement looks like this. As I scan my laser over, there's an overlap region of the flakes, which never looks very pretty, but it's this kind of odd shape. And when we shine the laser over that overlap region, you see that there's a bright 
photocurrent response. So this is a typical thing I'm going to show you is that we can spatially resolve the regions where photocurrent is being generated. And what we see in this picture is that when you have the overlap of graphene MOT to graphene, there's a very bright photoresponse. As you would expect, you're generating these excitons. Uh, they're being pulled apart by the voltage that we apply, and so we generate a photocurrent. So there's a strong interlayer photoresponse. And the key thing to point out is that it really only happens where the heterostructure exists. So only where graphene MOT2 and graphene uh, overlap. Now we can play games. So this is what our, our measurement allows us to do. The first thing we wanted to do was just see what happens as we turn up the laser power. Super simple, boring measurement, just to see what we'd expect. Um, and so we take an image at some low power and we just make a movie essentially of turning up the laser power. So we're gathering a lot of data. We can see that as I turn up the laser power, I get more photocurrent response. So pretty much exactly what you'd expect. But the idea here is that we have an approach where we can generate huge amounts of data. So now we can take these spatial maps as a function of a third parameter and generate movies from which we can extract information. And I'm gonna show you that this gets slightly more complicated before it gets simple. So I'm gonna walk you through some of these measurements uh, don't worry if you get lost a little bit, it will come back to simple in a bit. So what we can then do is we can take those maps, right? I have this stack of maps and I can pick a point and we can now plot photocurrent versus power. So from these maps at every position in space, we can plot photocurrent versus power. And what we saw was behavior that looked roughly like a square root, right? It looks kind of this typical square root behavior. Uh, we fit it to a power law so that we just had a, an experimental parameter to fit it, and it gave us a number that looked pretty close to a uh, square root, right? So pretty close to a half. Uh, but the advantage here was we, we can see this sublinearity at one position in space, but we wanted to look at it at every position in space. So what we did is we took that parameter, and this is where it gets a bit complicated. We can measure at every point in space on the heterostructure where it is nonlinear response. And we get kind of a, a boring result. This is when the pulses that we're shooting in are separated by long time scale. So 100 picoseconds between the two pulses. So it's almost like you're just doing a single pulse you know, every uh, 13 nanoseconds. It's a single pulse measurement. And when we do that, you see that it's sublinear, right? But it gives you a number that again, kind of sits around about a half. So it looks like this kind of square root behavior. Um, but now we have a, 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 thing, a, a way to look at the data. We see where the system is most nonlinear. We see that it's always kind of sublinear, um, and we can characterize that. But here's where we, we, we kind of go deep into data uh, intensive measurements. Now I can do that same exercise, right? I have these separated by 120 picoseconds. But now I can move my, my pulse that's on my delay stage through the time span and cross over my zero. So I'm basically doing a pump probe where I have the, you know, I can do it at negative times, I can do it at zero time, and I can do it at positive times. So I'm going to show you this movie a couple of times. This is basically just look at this as the nonlinear behavior uh, in that heterostructure. And what you see is that right at the middle of this video, let me show you one more time, you'll see it wink at you. So right in the middle, right as time approaches zero, blink. There's something that happens right in the middle of the device. Let me show you one more time just to make, make sure you see it. It's like a little eye winks at you, blink right around zero. What it showed us is that something is really happening when the two pulses overlap. It's very, very sublinear at that point. And so we take these maps and we can now go in and really focus on where we want to look. And, and we saw that that sublinearity happens when the pulses are just outside of one another, so just outside the pulse width. So when two pulses are basically uh, striking this heterostructure, it's very nonlinear. So now we went and dissected from this humongous data set, just a very simple map of the photocurrent maps as a function of power when the pulses are overlapped. And this is where we saw something really strange. <clears throat> so what you see is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the photoresponse increases just like you'd expect. But at a particular power, it forms this donut, right? Suddenly, the photocurrent in the middle uh, actually begins to decrease as we turn up the power. And so we continued to, we wanted to analyze this to understand its behavior. And so we did a, a clever trick, my student 
and I worked with uh, some folks at JPL and, and thought a lot about how they image things in space. We basically looked at this ring, this photocurrent ring, and we said this has kind of the topography of a mountaintop. And so you could say that the spatial derivative has to flatten out at the top of the mountain, right? The, the slope at the mountaintop is flat and in other places it's, it's steep. So what we did is we took that spatial derivative shown on the right and we wrote an algorithm that just lassos the looking for the zero derivative. So you have this algorithm that just works in from the outside and stops when you get to the top of the mountain. And so it gives us a, a size of this ring, okay? Now we had a way to, without any human intervention, kind of using the computer to do this, we can look at how this ring grows as the laser power turned on. And here's a map of that. So if you look on the right, you'll see that at first you don't see the ring and then suddenly this ring appears. So there's this kind of outward growth uh, of this uh, suppressed photocurrent. So again, we have hundreds of these maps and we can now plot the area of that ring. It's a very simple plot, right? I have a, a ring that doesn't show up for a while. So at low powers, there's nothing. Suddenly at about five milliwatts of average power, I see this ring appear. And then I plot the, the linear increase of that ring. Now we had an idea of what this was and I may be able to show you a movie at the end, uh, but basically we see a very different change that is very sharply defined. So there's this spontaneous ring that forms and then that ring begins to expand outward. And so we continued studying this for a long, long time. We have much more data than I can actually show, um, but we have other ways of looking at it. These are all coming from spatial maps. And so you see that there are features here where at, at the middle of this ring, the photocurrent is kind of dipping, right? So you have a valley, almost like a volcano. Um, and then you have this steep slope on the edge. And this all happens only at sufficient power. Um, the other thing you can do, and we quantify this, is that if it is really growing as an area, you can plot this as length squared, like the radius uh, of a circle, and it should also show that growth. And it does, right? So we know that this ring grows. Uh, it happens at a specific density, uh, and it gives very, very unusual behavior. So coming back to this cartoon, what it turns out, or what we believe that this is, is that as you increase this density, you can actually overcome the exciton-exciton annihilation rate, uh, as a, especially in a device that is basically able to collect these charge carriers very quickly in order to basically produce what was called the electron hole liquid. And again, digging back into the annals of history, uh, this had been thought a lot about in low temperature semiconductors. Most of these measurements were done below four Kelvin, but in the 1970s, there were review articles in science about how these electron hole liquids formed. And just like we've heard a lot about today, as you increase that density, you would see either by excitons or exciton exciton annihilation. And then eventually you would kind of catalyze the droplet into what looks like, just like you would see uh, water condense in a cloud and then eventually form this kind of macroscopic electron hole droplet, right? And so we, we studied this liquid quite a bit and I wanna talk a little bit about it because it's actually quite unusual. So it's sufficiently high density, right? We hit it with a, a short pulse at short delay times. We think we were basically creating this liquid. And again, going back to the, the 70s, uh, Keldish actually predicted this. Uh, it was based on some other work, but he said that when you reach this critical density, the electron hole pairs no longer couple to one another. They basically become like an ionic gas. You have free electrons and holes that couple through the medium. And what that would do is create a bound state that is more deeply bound, where you now are looking at what is an electron hole plasma, but it has liquid-like features like a surface tension, okay? So again, going back to even 1968, he tried to describe some data that was coming out of uh, scientists at US and Russia, and he tried to basically argue that there's a phase transition, which is now well-established at, at low temperatures. So what we believe is happening is we're actually seeing this droplet form and then grow. Um, and because we have so much data, we can understand quite a lot about this, this condensation. So let me point out this funny spatial feature because I think everybody kind of knows, okay, yeah, I have this donut that grows. How does that mean I have a liquid phase? Well, the way we understand this is the, is the way that we image. So basically 
if I scan my laser across a, a sample, I can measure the width of that Gaussian beam spot. And if I convolute that with a finite sample, right, our photocurrent signal is basically a convolution of my beam spot size with the size of my object, my detector in this case. Now what happens is when the intensity is high enough, so at the peak of my laser pulse uh, profile, I basically can form this liquid droplet. And what that means is that my spatial profile should then form a dip where the photocurrent is no longer being formed because it's a bound state. The liquid is basically trapped at those high intensities and my photocurrent drops. And now as I turn up my laser power, the size of that dip in the middle basically decreases because less and less photocurrent is being collected as I form this kind of bound droplet. And we did that uh, model, we can model that quite easily and compare it to our spatial profiles. And what you see is that it's a very, very good match between this very simplified model of a droplet forming at peak intensities and our experiment, which showed these, these kind of unusual spatial profiles. So what we can think of this as is that as my laser moves around on the sample, it's kind of dragging along with it this little droplet of electron hole pairs that have changed phase from the excitons. So we continued to study this, and I'll just go through some of these things very quickly. Um, we know that we had this kind of uh, what looks like a phase transition. We see that it grows linear, linearly with power, which implies that it's a uh, constant electron hole density. And I, I'll try to show this video, but there's a very simple experiment you can do to prove this, is pour a stream of water on the surface of a table. And what you'll see is that your water droplet grows uh, basically linearly with the rate of water that you're putting in, exactly like what we saw in this electron hole droplet. Um, and we can estimate what, what at the power that we see this, what's the inter-exciton spacing? And it comes out to somewhere between one and three nanometers, which matches very nicely what is known to be the Bohr radius of excitons in MOT2. So we know that at this particular power where we see all of this happen, the density is high enough that excitons are nearly touching one another. They're basically beginning to interact internally with other excitons in the system. And it's at an extremely high density. So this is almost like one exciton per cubic nanometer. And this material survives many, many, you know, even much higher power than that. So it's quite surprising, but now been kind of shown in, in many of these materials. Um, we can show all sorts of other things. It's polarizable. We can break up the fluid with an electric field. Uh, we are looking for a latent heat to see if it's truly a first order phase transition. We can see all of what we heard about in other talks were these kind of exciton, exciton annihilation effects. We can map in exquisite detail the kind of onset of exciton, exciton annihilation right before the liquid forms. Um, but I don't have too much time to show you uh, much of that here. But if, you, if you're interested, um, I can give you the homework assignment, uh, which is to go and read this paper. This was uh, published in 2019, by, led by my student Trevor. Um, this paper was called the Electron Hole Liquid, and we had seen it at room temperature, which was the first time that, that this type of physics had been seen at room temperature. Um, but more importantly, or I think equally importantly, is uh, the experiment which Trevor developed to do this. Some of these imaging techniques were developed uh, in collaboration with uh, the JPL and NASA. And so we also published a paper on that. So that's your, your homework assignment. But I did wanna point out a few other pieces here because just as a, to say that we're not the only ones doing this, um, there's a very similar uh, phase in high energy physics. So this is something that might be familiar to some of you. This is basically the, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it turns out that if you think about molecular gases, what we're doing is not the same as what you would think of as a molecular liquid, right? When I take uh, molecular H2O and I form it into a, a gas phase, it still remains H2O molecules, okay? So this is kind of the, the standard thermodynamic phase transition. In our case, we're starting with a, an exciton, so kind of a, a little molecular exciton species, but when it forms this new phase, the electron and hole, the constituents of the exciton, no longer are well-defined as excitons. They form essentially an ionic gas. And it's very akin to what high energy physicists have been looking at in what's called the quark-gluon plasma, 
when you essentially accelerate particles to very high energies, they form a plasma phase where their constituents are now separated out into this extremely energetic uh, plasma phase. And so sometimes in the literature, uh, and there continues to be a debate about whether we call our phase a high energy electron hole plasma or actually a liquid. And so there's a lot of things that we're still working on to, to do that. Now, I should also mention that there was some work soon after ours that was basically done around the same time where this room temperature electron hole liquid had been observed in MOS2. Um, and th there's even some nice theoretical work in the, and there's more beyond even these ones by the, the groups in North Carolina that have studied some of this physics. So there is a continuing uh, kind of group of people who are trying to understand this, this new phase. Um, but on top of that, there's even evidence for more exotic phases. Um, there's some evidence for very, very efficient ballistic movement coming out of Alexei's lab. Um, but there's now also growing evidence of even nearly room temperature or room temperature exciton, so quantum condensates uh, coming out of Kinfi's lab at, at Cornell. And so that we continue as a, as a group to understand these correlated exciton phases, but I think there's a big future here. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in some of more of the work, you should visit our website. We have a paper to appear in Nature in the next month on trions in, in moray lattices. So we heard a little bit about this moray physics. Uh, this is with the group of Joshua Louis. Um, I also study photosynthesis. We had a paper in science just last year on, on kind of thinking about photosynthesis. Uh, but really our life is, is trying to understand how light and, and matter interacts like I showed you today. And one last thing, one little pitch before I end, uh, I actually am hiring multiple postdocs. So I have three postdoc positions that I'm searching for. So if anybody out there uh, knows of anybody, two of these positions are in kind of the interface of nanoscience and quantum biology, uh, but the other is in, in two-dimensional materials and, and exotons. So in all of those cases, we're just looking for excellent people period. Uh, your background is not so as important as your enthusiasm for, for good science. So if anybody knows of anybody, please tell them to reach out to me. And of course, I need to thank everybody involved. I moved pretty quickly through this talk. I hope you were able to follow, but I think we've been primed uh, by the previous talks with a lot of great uh, background. Um, and of course, I should thank uh, all of the funding agencies, the PCASE Award and, and several other awards that have helped to fund uh, all the work going in my lab. Hey, great. Hey, thanks, uh, Nathan. We have time for a couple of questions, maybe. What is the lifetime of the electron hole liquid phase? Uh, this is a great question. I don't have it in this slide, but if you look in the paper, it comes out to about 30 picoseconds. So this is a, a rather short-lived um, mm -hmm. uh, condensate phase, but we think that we're actually seeing longer phases. It, one of the places we want to look are these interlayer exciton mm -hmm. phases, and that's where people have seen the Bose-Einstein condensation, where it's likely living uh, for nanoseconds. So we see a very short-lived phase. Okay. Uh, in, in this electron hole liquid state, how does the OJ recombination uh, scale with carrier density? Or you know, can you scale the carrier density in the electron? Yeah, hole liquid? yeah. So, so again, in, in our paper, this is a great question. We, we almost wrote a second paper, uh, but decided to put it into the supplement of this paper. Um, basically what we see uh, we, we had to re-describe how people uh, write down photocurrent for uh, exciton, exciton annihilation physics. Um, and what we see is that up to that threshold density of about you know, 0.5 per cubic nanometer uh, excitons, exciton, exciton annihilation really dominates. What I think happens in our case is that the lifetime uh, of the liquid is very, very short. So it's able to form immediately at the boundaries of the liquid, we actually see this exciton, exciton annihilation. So if you, if you look at our, uh, the details in the paper, you'll see that we've done a, a very detailed study to try to understand the exciton, exciton lifetime in photocurrent. So we weren't able to extract exactly the exciton, exciton annihilation rate, but we were able to uh, understand it in a rate equation for ex excited photocurrent, which also includes um, kind of the dissociation of electrons and holes. So if you look in our supplement, you'll, there's a lot of details there. I think that's a continuing work. I know of other people who have published several other papers uh, in that direction as well. Yeah. 
Uh, do you need to consider any coherent artifact between the pulses at zero delay? So when you see that, uh, I wish, I, pulse, I wish. Uh, we, we don't know yet. So, so we're, we're trying to learn. Um, you could think of it as an artifact or you could think of it as a really interesting piece of physics. And so we are looking at uh, if this phase is there, uh, there's a lot of possibility for coherent manipulation of the phase, um, especially using obviously laser pulses. Um, but another direction that's similar to that, and both of these we're working on, is we should be able to do plumbing. Uh, so there's kind of a classical plumbing of a liquid, but then there's kind of the quantum coherent uh, phases that might emerge in this liquid. And we're, we're, we're searching at, in both directions. Um, so that's a really good question. We can't say much about it yet, uh, but it's, it's something that we're working towards. Okay, I'm gonna try and shove in one more question, which is, goes to your plumbing comment, which is, can you gate the photocurrent detection system to measure the speed of the, uh, the electron hole, I guess that we're going to call it electron hole fluid propagates? Yeah. You know, how, this, how does it flow? Yeah. Okay. So we have a million ideas of how to test this. I actually, when I've given this talk recently, uh, we have a whole other experiment going on to try to image fluid flow lines. Um, one way, you know, you could propagate the liquid, which is one way to do it, but there's a, a really key measurement which we're, we're working towards, which is a liquid should have a well-defined surface tension. And if you ever take two droplets of water and bring them near each other, there's a point at which they combine and they form a meniscus. And that meniscus is how you determine a surface tension. So we basically have an experiment in mind of taking two lasers, dragging the liquid droplets toward one another and looking for two particle, two, two point correlations that would show this meniscus. So many of these ideas are great. We're still working on the plumbing, um, but I think that's a really good point is how do you look at the propagation speed of this uh, droplet inside a, a otherwise intrinsic crystal, right? It's a really good question. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. I know we're, we're over our allotted time. So yeah, I don't know if you have any, if you wanna add any comments and then, then we have the informal, we'll turn off the recording. No. After the session. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, I think it's okay. Great. <laughs>